have to speak short. And the idea here is to encourage dialogue between each of you. So uh, we want some conflict here. That'll provide the excitement, some back and forth. Uh, so remember, I'm keeping clock, uh, 10 minutes total, and the clock starts now. Please, uh, we'll start with Linda. Uh, I know she has to drop a little bit early. Um, uh, so first, 30 seconds maximum each to introduce yourself, and then we'll go to Linda for uh, the first discussion, and then back and forth. Linda, take it away, 30 seconds. Okay, I'm Linda Klein from Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm managing shareholder at Baker Donaldson, a law firm. I served as the first woman president of the State Bar of Georgia and as president of the American Bar Association, a worldwide professional association where access to justice issues are central to our work. My law practice involves efficiently resolving disputes between businesses, often using voluntary dispute resolution, usually mediation and arbitration instead of courts. And I also serve as a neutral, either a mediator and arbitrator, helping other lawyers, business clients solve their disputes. Thank you, Linda. Peter. Uh, yeah, even though I'm a lawyer, before I studied law, I had a career as a computer programmer, have a master's in computer science. I am of counsel at Foley and Lardner in our Dallas office, um, but I limited my law practice to representing buyers of information technology, cloud, e-commerce. And uh, I've been an arbiter for more than 30 years. And also um, I'm an adjunct law professor at SMU Dedman School of Law, and I've been there for 30 years. And glad to now be part of Thank you, Peter. And now the only non-lawyer, but he's a big talker, I know. Go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Hey, everyone. I'm Dennis Damon. I'm a chief privacy officer of Mara Post. Um, I'm also an advisor to the Department of Homeland Security Secretary uh, on privacy issues on a committee called the DIPIAC Committee. I'm also a frequent investor in uh, companies, especially in the sector uh, of this of the sorts of uh, compliance work as well. And uh, I've, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be back here again. Unfortunately, I am at the IEPP Privacy Security Risk Conference actually in San Diego. So I apologize for not being there in person. Thank you, Dennis. And now the biggest talker of them all, Alex, I am going to be tight on your timing. <laughs> oh, thanks, Bob. And it's great to, to be back uh, and see everybody again. I'm Alex Urbelis. I'm senior counsel for cybersecurity with Kroll and Mooring in their New York office. Uh, I started out in information security a long time ago, uh, frankly, as a teenage hacker. And according to many, my wife included, I went from bad to worse and became a lawyer. Uh, since then, I've worked uh, in defense and intelligence. I've worked at CIA, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. I was the chief compliance officer of Richmond, as well as in-house information security counsel for Richmond. Uh, and I was also there, recently. Alex. I'm cutting you off. Okay. Uh, well, well the, the most important part, though, I think, was that uh, uh, I was also the, the acting chief information security officer of the NFL fairly recently as well. Right. Hey, absolutely. Thank you, Alex. Uh, what, what's the NFL? You'll start first. I know you have to talk uh, a little bit earlier. So. You got it. Linda, please. So, uh, Take it off. I'm going to I'm going to get started by bringing all of this to the basics. Uh, and uh, this is not for me going to be a gizmo headed portion of the presentation. I'm just going to give you some practical background knowledge about solving business disputes. It's not going to help you much when you're dealing with cyber criminals, uh, but may well help you when you're working on disputes with vendors and others. Uh, when I first started practicing law, almost every di business dispute that wasn't resolved by negotiation was resolved in the courtroom. And today, most disputes are still resolved by negotiation between businesses and often without lawyers. However, when negotiation does not settle things, we have the option of using any number of types of alternative dispute resolution instead of going to court. Unless your contract requires alternative dispute resolution, which I'm going to call ADR from here on, uh, your dispute is likely going to wind up in litigation. And litigation means that if you cannot settle your case, it goes to court. Why? Because if you wait until after the dispute arises, one side or the other will see an advantage to litigation based on the circumstances and refuse ADR. So first point, write ADR into your contract, and we'll come back to this. Well, let's start from the beginning and ask, why would you want to use ADR instead of litigation? ADR is almost always cheaper than a courtroom trial. 
ADR, and we'll talk about some of the types of ADR if we have time later, allows you to limit expensive activities that are unique to court. Uh, for example, discovery, that means depositions, that's sworn testimony taken from witnesses to learn what they know, and paper discovery, uh, interrogatories that are written questions and answers, or requests to produce documents. All of that can be limited to a more cost-effective amount in ADR. Uh, a lot of technology companies are growing fast and they're short on cash. There's no time for litigation and certainly no money for it. Uh, disputes need to be resolved quickly. There isn't a budget for litigation. So ADR is cheaper than litigation. Using ADR, you're not going to have your case decided by jurors who don't know you, don't know your type of business, don't want to be there, but they were subpoenaed to be there and they're really unhappy about it. Uh, but a lawyer friend told them that if they didn't obey the subpoena, they could get arrested for not showing up for jury duty. Even if you have a trial with, with just a judge and not a jury, the judge won't know much about your business either. In ADR, you can choose who resolves your case. You can choose an expert in your field. In ADR, you can also choose the date and the time and the place you want to resolve your dispute. In court, you usually appear on a calendar and wait your turn. Often, you and your lawyers have to get ready for trial several times over several months and still not get reached. And when it is your turn, you have to drop everything and run to the courthouse. Generally, it takes years to get to trial, and this is especially true in COVID times. Meanwhile, your business is waiting for a resolution. I'm not denigrating our justice system. It is like this because it is woefully underfunded. Criminal and family law matters must come before business disputes. And here in Georgia, uh, the court system, the entire third branch of government gets less than one penny of every tax dollar. And we're not unique. Also, keep in mind that the pandemic has lengthened the time to trial even further. Uh, courts were closed for months. They've not recovered. And few have been unable to find a safe way to bring jurors back. You know, you've seen a jury box. You know, people are sitting shoulder to shoulder. Uh, the courts are still working it out. Funding's in short supply, and that complicates the issues. With some rare exceptions, which are very unlikely in a business dispute, everything that happens in litigation is in public record. ADR is generally private and can be strictly confidential if the parties agree. If the goal is to keep business relationships intact despite a dispute, it is more likely to do that with ADR because it's less formal, more cost-effective, and is generally less, less adversarial. I see we have a few minutes, so I'm going to talk about the types of ADR. There are basically two types, voluntary and mandatory. And within those categories, your imagination is the only limit to how you can design your dispute resolution process. So let's talk about voluntary resolution. The most common form of voluntary ADR is negotiation. You've been doing it since you were a toddler, negotiating bedtime. And when negotiation fails, the most common next step is to use mediation. And mediation is a non-binding negotiation using a neutral party to help facilitate the resolution. No one can force you to do anything. The parties agree on a neutral. And as a neutral myself, I can tell you it is the fastest, cheapest way to resolve a dispute short of negotiation. It is most likely to preserve business relationships because you can settle in ways that a court cannot do. A court can generally only award money. In mediation, you can sell for more services or products or software licenses instead of money. Or you can settle for payment at a later date or a payment plan. Sometimes you can solve a problem in mediation if everyone agrees to be there when it couldn't happen in court because you can't bring all the parties into the same court. For example, sometimes the parties are from different countries 
and you can't require them to come to the U.S. to resolve the dispute. Now, think about how great it would be to have a mediation that solves a problem with multiple parties like all that at once. Again, you can be creative. Think about choosing a mediator who's known to be creative. What's a mediation like? I don't want to kid you. If you're a business owner in a mediation, the day, and, and most disputes are mediated in one long day, but that day can be quite boring. And if you'll be sitting in a room with your lawyer, sometimes for hours while you wait for the mediator to come back to talk to you, you have to trust that the mediator is making progress. So just bring work to do while you wait. Choose your mediator really carefully. I think it's more important for the mediator to have proper skills than subject matter expertise. The mediator has to get everyone to agree, which involves you know, building trust with the parties in a short period of time. Let's talk about mandatory resolution. The most common type of mandatory ADR is arbitration. This is like a private trial where you choose the judge and there can be more than one judge, one arbitrator, you can have usually three. There are rules that govern arbitrations that have been written by many different organizations. Uh, the most common set of arbitration rules is maintained by the American Arbitration Association and you can find them online. However, you can make whatever rules fit your case. You can make rules designed to streamline the process. But I recommend that you decide those rules in advance, not after you have a dispute. However, most parties just incorporate rules already written by an organization into their contracts. Let's talk quickly about what you need to draft into your contract to assure you have reserved the ability to use ADR in resolving your disputes. You've got your final minute here, Linda. Okay. You can be as detailed as you want, so long as the parties to a contract agree. I always say when you create a contract, you want to plan for the business divorce while you're still happy in the early stages of the relationship. And with that, uh, I will say thank you very much and make sure you require ADR in your contracts. Thank you very much, Linda. That's excellent. Uh, who would like to follow that? Just jump right in. Alex. Sure, I could, I could jump on in and I, and I think it, it flows naturally from <clears throat> from Linda's, because I'm talking a bit about um, ADR when it comes to the, the DNS or the domain name system. And specifically, I want to talk about a, a cybersecurity blind spot, uh, the domain name system, the DNS, and some of the really nasty stuff that uh, I've been seeing over years of tracking. Uh, and groups, APT groups, advanced persistent threat groups that we are monitoring. And, and I think the benefits of, of the legal department and security departments working together to mitigate and reduce this type of risk. So what, what is the DNS? The domain name system itself has been a really critical component of the internet for, you know, really since its inception. It's why we don't have to memorize IP addresses, but it's also infrastructure that's been subject to right now decades of abusive conduct. And, and in particular, cyber squatting, typo squatting, registering domain names that are permutations of a company. And in fact, it's almost 22 years now that the WWF, the World Wide Wrestling, the World Wrestling Federation, um, not, not the World Wildlife Federation, filed its first UDRP <clears throat> uh, to reclaim a domain name. And the UDRP, it's a bit of a misnomer, it should be UDNRP, but it stands for the Uniform Domain Name Resolution Policy. And it's an abbreviated arbitration to reclaim a domain name from a cyber squatter. And today we see threat actors using the DNS or the domain name system for highly sophisticated cyber attacks. Now, in the meantime, DNS enforcement through things like the UDRP and these abbreviated arbitrations have, uh, have been really been taking the form of brand protection. And it's been become a game of whack-a-mole. And many companies at this point are really just throwing their hands up and saying, you know, they can't do it. There's too much activity. But if you if you think of the DNS or the global domain name system as a garden, well, weeds are going to tend to grow in unattended gardens. And if you leave a garden to become completely overgrown, you're going to find out that sooner or later you have snakes running around that garden. And we can't afford 
to ignore these risks coming from the DNS any longer to make matters worse. It's become a blind spot and a major blind spot for a lot of organizations precisely because the DNS presents problems of a hybrid nature. Uh, on the one hand, the DNS and the domain name system is a legal problem that has cybersecurity implications. But on the other hand, it's a security problem that has legal implications because it deals with things like trademarks and names and arbitrations. And so in a lot of organizations, no one actually has or really wants ownership of this risk. And so the problem is going to fester. And it's unfortunate because emanating from the DNS is a great deal of risk and addressing that risk collaboratively between the legal department and the security department is a great way to build bridges and trust between legal and security. So on to what we're seeing, you know, both old and new, we're still seeing a lot of phishing attacks from typo squatted domain names, but that's not where the real threats are coming from. The truly nasty stuff here is below the surface level of the domain name system in the world of subdomains. Um, or, or DNSA records for the more technically inclined folks that are listening that are out there. In fact, it was a, a GRU or Russian intelligence spear phishing operation using subdomains that compromised John Podesta and the DCCC uh, just ahead of the 2016 election. And I want to illustrate why subdomains, by using a prop here, uh, are, are used by uh, sophisticated cyber adversaries and especially state-sponsored threat actors. And I know we're not allowed to use slides here, but let's take a look at, at a, let's say this is a domain name, right? Something like com dash, let's say we register this, com dash validate dash session dot email or com dash reset password dot link. Now, if I want to create a subdomain, that's to the left of the actual domain name, and I can create anything I want. I can make it any name that I want. I don't have to go through a domain registrar. This all happens at the internet service provider level or your web host level. So I can make a subdomain, let's say hypothetically, something that looks like these two. I can just add Boeing to the front of this. And then we have a domain name that looks like boeing.com-validate-session Dot email, which is an actual domain extension now, or gmail.com dash reset password dot link, all through the registration of a domain name that nobody's going to be paying attention to because it doesn't implicate any trademark or, or naming or even common law rights, it's generic terms, and creating a subdomain on top of that. So it becomes very powerful as a tool for sophisticated threat actors. And unlike domain names for which there are several IP enforcement mechanisms, the UDRP is one, um, there is no legal mechanism, no abbreviated arbitration to swiftly remove a subdomain. So using subdomains, uh, I've been tracking one group of, of threat actors that has targeted over 1,700 organizations in the United States alone, most of which are in uh, critical infrastructure, chemical manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, state and local government, energy companies, pipelines, not surprisingly, uh, the oil and gas industry. Another group that I've been tracking was targeting uh, intergovernmental organizations or IGOs. Uh, and it was tracking this and through use of subdomains and tracking subdomains is how I picked up a live state sponsored attack on the World Health Organization last March, in uh, March of 2020, at the height of the coronavirus uh, hysteria. And um, that was later attributed, not my own attribution, to the work of the government of South Korea. I'm tracking another group at the moment right now, all again using subdomains and generic domains to target persistently and perniciously the entertainment sector, from uh, music producers and, and music companies to movie studios and films to PR companies. Now, the imminent danger here, to bring this back to, to reality, is that there's credential, these types of credentials harvesting attacks in the domain name system can easily lead to a ransomware event. A threat actor could use the account to spread malware throughout an organization, to establish persistence, to make lateral moves around a network, or those credentials could be handed over to a ransomware group for exploitation and profit sharing what's become known now as ransomware as a service, a collaboration between threat actors to deploy ransomware and share the profits. So the takeaway here is that you can't rely on brand protection for information security anymore. That's a tool that's ill-fitted for its purpose. It's like trying to jack a car up uh, you know, using a, a crowbar. You, you, it's not gonna work and you're just gonna end up hurting yourself. Uh, 
one of the things that I've developed is a very unique and powerful way to scour the DNS using a, a, a threat intelligence system that I coded and put together myself, watching subdomains and identifying early stage indicators of cyber attacks as a form of proactive threat intelligence. And I don't recommend continuing to play whack-a-mole with every single domain name that pops up. It's just not efficient for major brands. It can be way too much. But what I've developed are better and smarter ways to identify and neutralize these sophisticated risks originating from the DNS by looking at the DNS differently and by utilizing those legal mechanisms, ADR in particular, and the UDRP much more efficiently by aggregating and identifying networks and groups of threat actors so that you can assert your rights efficiently and economically and take down networks of bad actors. And, um, and, and we do this as well by looking at the DNS from the perspective of an attacker to go back to, to my misspent youth uh, that I mentioned at the beginning here. And, and when legal and security work together, which is what we really want to facilitate in 2021 and beyond, the result can really be a, a case study about how proactive and multidisciplinary cybersecurity can reduce risks and eliminate blind spots. Um, that's what I've got for now and happy to join the conversation. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Uh, uh, Linda, you're going to have to drop. Uh, Peter, uh, why don't you take it away from there or start something new? Okay, yeah, that's fine. And I was uh, honored, of course, to be part of this discussion today. And Alex and Linda and I had a similar discussion last year. It's kind of great to be doing this. Uh, I guess the part to me that is critical, a few things, obviously, that both Linda and Alex said. Um, I certainly agree with Linda about the importance of trying to avoid going to the courthouse. Now, in the United States, courts are different and they operate differently than they do in most countries around the world. So if you're outside of the United States, I generally think, and, and I encourage my clients to go to arbitrations and not even consider going to the courthouse because it's just more complicated. So I think that's important. The other part of it is even in court, the house odds are 50-50. I've had cases in 38 states around the United States. You never know whether a judge is gonna understand it. And the unfortunate reality is Everyone in, in this program understands probably there's not a single judge in the United States that understands what we've been talking about for the past three days. And the likelihood you, you're going to get through to them, 50-50 at best. So there's the, you don't want that to happen. So I agree with the arbitration approach. The other thing I agree with what, what Alex was talking about is the advanced persistent threat problem in the world we live in today. But I think the real problem that we've got and this is huge in terms of the cyber world. And that is all businesses around the world use the cloud. And I would say in my experience, when I talk to people and give speeches around the country, I would say less than 1% of the population ever reads the cloud agreement, let alone they just do a click agreement and they take whatever they get. So the negotiations that Linda was talking about, there's no negotiation. If AWS says you're going to go fight with them in, you know, this court or that court or whatever, nobody negotiates those things in cloud agreements. The other reality of it associated with it is, just to give you an example, I recently negotiated a contract with Stripe. So one of my clients could use the credit cards all over the world and they have operations all over the world. Well, the Stripe contract they gave us was six pages and it was a pricing agreement. I had to look at 37 different sets of online terms to figure out how to edit the six page pricing agreement. And they were in conflict with one another. And even the cybersecurity promises that are made are not there. I'm in the middle of a due diligence right now for a client to buy a, a, a company that uses the cloud. And they told us, the seller told us, they just use the standard click agreement. They didn't negotiate location. As a result, the country, as everyone knows, the law of the country where the data happens to reside controls. And so as a result, this seller has no idea where their data is anywhere around the world. So can they be in compliance with GDPR or CCPA or any other law, and, and, and depending of, of, of Chinese of privacy laws? So the problem I think we have is that we all rely on these standard click agreements, yet nobody reads them. And that's a pretty scary proposition. Now, the other part that goes along with it is, 
for those of you who've looked at this, the SOC 2 type 2 reports, ISO 27001, nobody reads them. And yet they tell us what kind of cybersecurity promises are being made by the cloud providers. I had a client last year that did a major uh, ERP system uh, with a cloud provider, not naming names because it doesn't really make any difference. And I told the lawyer, my, my in-house counsel, I said, you need to read the SOC 2 type 2 report. And she said, I don't want to read it. I have people in my infosec department that can read it. I don't need to know. And I said, yeah, you need to read the first 27 pages because the reality of what we have is the, the buyers of services need to understand what the, their cyber risk is and what kind of insurance is there. So last fall, I was negotiating a cyber deal and the, and the vendor offered us a million dollars worth of cyber coverage. Well, the SOC 2 Type 2 report said they have $15 million worth of coverage. So that's what we've insisted on when we negotiate the contract. So those kinds of things get ignored. And then when you litigate about them later or you arbitrate about them, if you haven't done your job to get ready, you're going to lose. And I think that's the reality as we all, you know, of the, all of us lawyers know that you don't want to go to court knowing that you forgot to check the box and you forgot to read the contract. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Dennis, uh, please uh, comment and, or expand or go into a different direction. No, I'm happy to. I'm happy to, Bob. I'll try to keep it short here. I know that um, I, I agree quite a bit with what we've already heard, you know, as, as Linda was talking about earlier. Um, and I know that Peter's kind of mentioning this as well, is that, you know, yeah, the, the issue, especially going down this, this way of, of, of ADR, um, makes it much easier. I, I'm literally in the middle of a case right now that is uh, that actually has two different venues, a U.S. and a Canadian venue. You know, the U.S. venue is actually moving a little bit faster, but it'll be still next year. You know, before we kind of get to where we need to be on it. But in the Canadian courts, I mean, we don't even have a date, and they're talking like five, seven years out. I mean, Canada's system is is, is way different. Obviously, I think Peter just mentioned that a little bit. It's way different than it is here in the U.S. But they are so overloaded there right now that it's just. Um, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. And we begin to sort of worry about what happens with memory and evidence and other things as well as that time passes on, you know, to begin with. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with what, what's been said around the cost of experts. Um, and I think, Peter, you just mentioned one of the things that I, that I wanted to jump on, which was also, you know, yeah, venue location, right? Um, you know, too many times for me, we, you know, we spend hours, if not days, going through this agreements, um, especially when we're looking at arbitration within the contract. Uh, and deciding which state it's going to be in, whether it's the state of our company or whether it's the state of their company in terms of their headquarters. But then, as you just mentioned, Peter, right, uh, we have to start to now also worry about processor versus controller in a sense, right? Um, you know, if, uh, if if GDPR or another um, you know country law is is to take effect, and and I think you used a very good example there, Peter, like with China, like you're almost not even at that point dealing with law, but you're not dealing with the government in a sense and their own um, rights and issues and and uh, you know things that they you know do in, in terms of managing a lot of the companies that are over there. So that has been a, a big concern for us, and it is one of the big contention points that we have to kind of go through back and forth on on a pretty regular basis. But interestingly enough, you know, from a security privacy perspective, as we're looking at, you know, uh, vendor contracts, vendor assessments, uh, you know, talking to clients and again, going through their processes. One of the other areas that that we tend to run into is, you know, the breach insurance you know, arena. You know, I remember just a few short years ago in the last 10 years or so, you know, getting breach insurance had become more difficult, not in the sense of just trying to obtain it. But in trying to understand what type of breach insurance that you should have and what their requirements are, you know, in, in a sense, and it all sort of began with the idea that okay, yeah, sure, you've got breach insurance, but does it cover third parties? Does it cover cloud providers? And then from there, you know, what sorts of, of requirements will that insurance company need to be able to, I guess, get proof that maybe that there should be a payout? or maybe a payout should not occur and whether or not that happens within the court system or does happen in arbitration. Um, and we are seeing in some of those contracts and some of those breach uh, insurance uh, contracts, we're starting to see them push for an ADR sort of process now because it's usually on their terms. And they're usually gonna bring in the company or the people that they want to be between you and and the, and, and the company or the, or the client that you're having to deal with. Um, and that's thrown another wrench in it, you know, in a sense. I, I find it to be good, obviously from an ADR perspective, but again, it's like, well, I kind of want it to be on a, on a more open level playing field. And if it's going to be on the insurance terms, the, the breach insurance company's terms, um, well, that may not go my way if they decide that 
you know, we didn't do the right things in terms of um, having the right policies in place or the right procedures or technologies. You know, a lot of breach policies will not pay out uh, if you're found to have, you know, not followed your own procedures or, you know, if you've, uh, you know, not followed regulations and things like that. They're no longer just kind of haphazardly paying out anymore. They want you to do your part as well. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's been a, a, another big thing for us that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, come up as well. So. Well, let me let me jump on that because I think that's Please. really important what Dennis just said on the insurance. Um, I've represented insurance companies over the years, and I think everyone participating in this program understands the reality that insurance companies are in the business of not paying. Yeah. They can figure out a way to avoid it. They will do yeah. that. Yeah. And the reality of what we have with the cyber criminals, everyone knows this, what they did last week. And what they're doing today is not what they're going to be doing next week or next month or next year. So the the insurance coverage is a moving target and it gives the insurance companies an excuse to not pay claims. And there's nothing anybody can do about it, but I'm just saying that's the reality of where we are in dealing with insurance. And a a couple of years ago, I had a a, a meeting with uh, an insurer, a cyber insurance company guy, uh, salesman, and he made the comment, the first thing they do when they have a new potential cyber insurance uh, customer is they interview the board members. Mm-hmm. The less the board members know, the higher the premium, which I think makes a lot of sense as the reality of what kind of trouble you get in for not managing things properly. Alex, I think you've probably been there too, right? Oh, no doubt. And, you know, bu- building off, I think, both what, what you mentioned, Peter, earlier and Dennis, you know, is the, you know, the fact that if, if you don't understand the, the model in which you're in, especially when it comes to some kind of cloud shared responsibility model, then you're going to be in there in, in a world of hurt, right? I mean, you really have to read those kind of, especially when you're migrating a critical service over to the cloud, you have to understand the contours and the parameters of who is doing what with respect to security. And you have to work it out ahead of time. You know, it was like what, what Linda was saying before, you know, you're creating agreement, you know, you know, while you're, while you're getting married, figuring out who's going to do what. Um, also, how to break that up is, is incredibly important. But when it comes to, to patching and patch management, the cloud is a, a major target here. Um, and, and it has, I think, very significant cyber liability implications as well. Because if you do not necessarily understand who's doing what with respect to patching and any kind of security enhancements or bolt-ons uh, that need to be performed on a, a, a server that's on, in the cloud, well, you know, again, like I was talking about, that could end up being some kind of rift of responsibility where one party thinks they're doing it, the other party thinks the other party's doing it, and it never gets done. If you have an unpatched system in the cloud, especially if it's something critical like an exchange server, well, the automation of exploitation now is very prevalent with threat actors. This will be identified. They will figure out the vulnerabilities that exist in whatever cloud server is out there, and it will be automatically exploited. And then the threat actors can go back to it at their leisure. They might drop something like a web shell into a vulnerable exchange server, which we've seen many times. In fact, I've been dealing with a a ransomware event for uh, a few weeks now where that was the the initial attack vector. And that can very easily move into uh, something like, uh, you know, a threat actor establishing persistence, moving around, finding the high grade ore and deploying an encryptor that is going to result in a ransomware event. And then when you try to activate your cyber liability insurance, if it turns out that you may have had an unpatched system, or let's say, you know, this security vulnerability was known for six or seven months, and neither you nor your cloud service provider had patched it, well, then you are very likely going to be in the unfortunate situation of having insurance, but no coverage. Thank you. You know, another important issue along with that, I think, is that we all rely on software as a service or, you know, and, and, but we do not necessarily do a deep dive as to whether or not the software as a service provider actually does disaster recovery. And I had a, a situation a few years ago where one of my hospitals uh, discovered that uh, they had an outage for 27 hours and there was no backup. And it turns out that the software as a service provider 
who was doing the disaster recovery had never tested to see successfully to see whether or not their DR worked. Well, you can't recover data, particularly in ransomware, if you can't get the data because it's never been backed up. You got a big problem. You and do I think insurance Thank doesn't you. cover that. <laughs> so, Dennis, you've got the last word here before I get the hook. Oh, uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. I, I, again, I think what, what Alex just brought up, I you know, was agreeing with, like in, in terms of the cloud providers, you know, it's interesting to, 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 again, see how companies are moving as fast as they are. And, you know, as an investor and a mentor, as, as Bob knows, I, I, I deal a lot with the startup community in, in uh, you know, well, around the world, but especially in Texas. And it's fun for me to be able to sit down sometimes and talk to these startups to say, hey, you know, like, what are you guys doing around security by design or privacy by design? And it's funny that as, as I was talking about breach insurance and whatnot that when I quickly tell them like okay great that you guys are working at a thousand miles an hour and whatnot but you know um, yeah, as you guys get bigger and bigger and bigger you have to now start to realize that not only um, the, the location of, of your PII but the locations all the locations of what your apps are built on because again depending on the terms and conditions and again like with those insurance policies I've seen breaches that have happened they go to their insurance company the insurance company literally says well yeah you didn't have the cloud provision or you didn't have the AWS provision that was in there so we're not paying out sorry end of story and it's it's kind of a sad state of affairs so yeah it, other than that it's you know it, it's, it just sort of goes down to know as well where all your information you know is um you know as, as you're doing your your privacy impact assessments know where the data is know where your applications are um and make sure that your attorneys are, are part of that decision and are part of that knowledge as well so that they know how to negotiate their contracts well uh -huh. and i think that, that was so important one minute it's or, important to have a lawyer that understands peter, what they go ahead i spoke over you peter please well i didn't I hear what you said. why don't you repeat that i was uh, speaking over you peter so. you no know, what i was saying was i think the critical comment that dennis just made is that it makes sure that your lawyer understands what we're talking about here, because most lawyers do not understand all this junk. And it's important that your lawyer understand. it. Thank you, Alex, uh, to sum up for one minute. Sure. Uh, and I, I just want to build off what, what Peter was saying there, too. And some of them let's talk about uh, incidents and, and recovering from incidents. It's incredibly important to have a lawyer who understands not just how to read a statute, how to interpret a statute, but the fundamental technologies at issue and what's actually happening in your network and in the aftermath of an incident. Because what you're going to have to do after you have an incident, whether it's ransomware or some other cyber related incident, is you're going to have to communicate with a mess of individual parties. It's going to be regulators, it's going to be ICOs, it's going to be clients, it's going to be the media. And you have to fundamentally understand what's happening as a lawyer to manage those external communications. If you communicate something that winds up being a misinterpretation of what was happening on the network, and that's gone over to your clients, and then the information commissioner's office requests a copy of what you had sent to individual clients or third parties, and there is a mismatch or a fundamental misunderstanding of what was happening, then your lawyer is just gonna end up making things worse. So the lawyer has to understand technology, has to understand what's happening, and uh, I would say, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, be involved in really every step of every phase of incident response these days. Alex, thanks very much. Dennis, Peter, and Linda, thank you. I'm getting the hook, so that means we're all getting the hook. Thank you. That was wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks everyone, thank you for the panel. And uh, let's have the last and concluding panel. If you can bring up the panelists. Uh, we are here two by two, right? Richard and uh, Alex and Dennis.